Good morning and welcome to worship this morning. I am not Pastor Jenna. Pastor Jenna is on vacation this week and we wish her a week of rest and relaxation and restoration. I'd like to thank Rebecca Gordon, Pastor Rebecca Gordon, for filling in as our guest preacher today. Um, just a couple announcements. Uh, one is the uh, Byersdorf funeral is this coming Friday, the 16th at 10 a.m. here at St. Andrew. Um, it would be awesome if we could support Bonnie and her family in that celebration of life of someone who impacted all of us dearly here. I don't have any other announcements unless anyone else has something for the good of the group. All right, then please stand as we begin with our call to worship. New every morning is God's love for us. New every day. To seek ways to heal the world. And to draw closer to our Creator. So let us worship God. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who greets us in this and every season, whose word never fails, whose promise is sure. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of our neighbors. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned, we have hurt our community, we have squandered your blessings, we have poured your love to you. In the name of Jesus, forgive us and grant us your mercy. You are freed and forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ.
Are you feeling well? I know, okay. <coughs> Sometimes I get a little tickled. Okay, well, I want to bring something today to show you because in today's readings, we hear about Jesus healing people. And does anybody know what this is? You know what this is? That's to listen to your heart, right? You put it in your ears.
of Genesis, the 12th chapter, beginning at the first verse. The Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham was seventy-five years old when he departed from Haran. Abraham took his wife Sarai and his brother's son Lot, and all the possessions that they had gathered, and the persons whom they had acquired in Haran. And they set forth to go to the land of Canaan. When they had come to the land of Canaan, Abraham passed through the land to the place of Shechem, to the oak of Moreh. At that time the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved on to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, with Bethel on the west and I on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and invoked the name of the Lord. And Abraham journeyed on by stages toward the Negev. The word of the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Jenna asked me to come back and, 
and preach and while she is away and it is simply good to be in a, faith, a place that is familiar with, uh, with your faces again. So thank you very much. Please pray with me. Lord God, open our hearts that we might receive your word of God and open my lips to declare your praise. In Jesus' name. So this story would have made its original readers or hearers very uncomfortable. What did Jesus just do? He called a tax collector to be part of his inner circle. Jesus was already surrounded by rough and tumble working men, mostly fishermen. It would have been scandalous, embarrassing, shameful. There are so many, many things wrong with this picture. Now, we don't know much about Matthew. Just that he was at his booth, his table. He was a tax collector. A sinner, say the Pharisees. Those who were known to violate familial or community welfare. A sinner. Now, the tax collector was a very complex position in Jesus' world. Scholars have really struggled to define their role. It's thought that they were perhaps not totally universally despised, but they were not thought to be generally upstanding family men, not landowners. They worked for the Romans. They were tools of the occupying empire, and they sullied themselves with Roman money not necessarily corrupt, they were, but they were not necessarily either wealthy off the backs of their peers, but many of them, most of them, may have been. The Jewish Annotated New Testament mentions that rabbis discussed tax collectors in the same vein as other criminals, such as robbers. They certainly worked for a system of occupation and oppression and were regarded at best with suspicion and at worst with disgust and loathing. And here comes Jesus encountering Matthew at his trade and he offers a simple invitation. Follow me. Matthew gets up and follows when Jesus invited, he stood up from his booth and left it all. Not only this, he called his friends around him, the convention of tax collectors and sinners. Come to dinner and experience this Jesus. And now the Pharisees show up. They take offense at this questionable, morally deviant, socially outcast gathering at Jesus' table. And they're stunned, confused. They're maybe too embarrassed to ask Jesus himself, and so they go to his disciples. Why does he do this? Why does he do this? Those with power are not pleased. Hanging out with riffraff, sinners? Why did they care? It was simply not done. Who they were would rub off on you. And yet, if we blame the Pharisees here, we've missed the point, haven't we? The doctors don't hang out with the janitors in the cafeteria. The cheerleaders don't hang out with the computer nerds at the commons. The soccer moms don't hang out with felons. Seventh graders certainly don't hang out with sixth graders, right? <laughs> of course, these are gross overgeneralizations, but you get the picture. The Pharisees were as good at naming who is in and who is out as we are. Drawing lines, making rules, crafting a system of judgment to determine those who were desirable and those who were not desirable. 
And Jesus welcomed a whole band of these undesirable sinners around him. A faithful leader would never do this. Why was Jesus? His answer? I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I desire welcome, not judgment. I desire inclusion, not rules. Professor and social worker Dr. Brene Brown has been in the national spotlight with her research on shame. I imagine many of you have heard of her by now. Maybe you're familiar with not, but these are some of the titles of her books. The Gifts of Imperfection, Daring Greatly, How the Courage to be Vulnerable Transforms the Way We Live, Braving the Wilderness. Now, Dr. Brown freely admits that her work makes most people very uncomfortable. She tells the story of that she's on an airplane. If she really wants to just kind of shut up her seatmate, she just has to tell her that she's a shame researcher. We don't understand shame very well in our culture. But it's rampant. Maybe even pandemic, should we say. Shame happens when we don't consider ourselves worthy enough. When we dwell in our imperfections and name our own selves unworthy, either by our standards or our societies. Renee Brown's theory is very simple. The antidote to our inevitable shame is meaningful human connection. Deep, genuine, wholehearted human connection. And this kind of connection is only possible through our authenticity and our vulnerability. This is from the back of one of her books. Our imperfections are what connect us to one another and to our humanity. Our vulnerabilities are not weaknesses. They are powerful reminders to keep our hearts and minds open to the reality that we are all in this together. She writes, we need our lives back. It's time to reclaim the gifts of imperfection the courage to be real, the compassion we need to love ourselves and others, and the connection that gives true purpose and meaning to life. These are the gifts that bring love, laughter, gratitude, empathy, and joy into our lives. I'm all in. How about you? Despite the sin of Matthew that others would fear being infected with, Jesus crosses that line that others have drawn. Those in power want to categorize, moralize, and elevate Matthew's shame, making Matthew so very vulnerable in this story. But ultimately, the story is not about Matthew. It's not Matthew who should be shamed. Jesus goes out on a limb, crossing those cultural, theological, and social boundaries for Matthew, offering him authentic relationship. Jesus allows himself to be vulnerable to shame so that he might heal Matthew's. Matthew leaves his table exits his booth as he follows, eagerly, willingly, one of Jesus' inner circle, trusted, beloved. The same is true for us. Jesus allows himself to be vulnerable to shame so that he might heal ours individual, our family, our communities, our churches. Matthew left behind his position, his power, his coercion, his shame. What are we called?
to leave behind. Like Abram and Sarai, as they pack up their household and head out to the land God has called them to, it's not so much what they take, I imagine, it's what they leave behind. What are you being called away from to follow Jesus? What is familiar and comfortable to you? Is it the stories we tell ourselves about why things are the way they are? Painful relationships that are hindering your growth. Maybe it is the destructiveness of power and greed and addiction and hopelessness. Maybe away from dreams that no longer fit the plan for your life and your families. Maybe away from an infatuation with productivity and grinding culture. But all too familiar burden are you being called to be behind? When Jesus calls, he crosses into the most tender, vulnerable places and calls us away from sin and death and shame. Jesus has an antidote for shame today. And it's the same as Brene Brown's connection, relationship, empathy, authenticity. Jesus overcomes our sin and shame, our isolation and embarrassment, our humiliation, our feelings of inadequacy and unworthiness. The tax collector has a place of worthiness at a new table. The flow of blood is stopped. The woman is healed and can once again fully join her community. The corpse comes back to life. The young girl gets out of bed ready to dance again. An elderly couple settle into a new land ready for a new legacy. Jesus participates in a feast with sinners. God provides a healing touch. Jesus' holiness transforms shame. Jesus raises up. Whomever he touches becomes clean and holy and beautiful, restored and healed to new life, new community, new relationship. <clears throat> Jesus crosses those boundaries for us. God humbled God's self to come to us as Jesus, and God willingly takes on whatever it takes. Good news? Difficult news, I think. Because it does call for our vulnerability. It calls us also to cross a boundary. We are invited to have that relationship. But to do so, we must receive the gift. We must stand up and leave our own tax booth behind and cross the boundary ourselves. Jesus touches us through baptismal waters, names us, forgives us, seals us to God, and marks us with a sign of never-failing love, claimed as his own, not just once, but forever. He continues to feed us through bread and wine of Holy Communion, feeding not only our bodies, but our spirits. Jesus gives us our lives back. Full, wholehearted lives. Jesus, through his sacrifice and vulnerability, frees us from what was to curiosity and courage to embrace what can be. Giving us the courage to be real, authentic, compassionate to ourselves and others, naming us good and inviting us to forgive ourselves, our imperfections, and others' errors. You are worthy. You are enough. <coughs> Follow me, says Jesus. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and steadfast love. Come not to call the righteous, but sinners. Let 
let us with Matthew get up and follow the one who shows mercy to all, the one who is mercy and love itself. Thanks be to our imperfections, all of our fears and failures, we surrender them to our Savior, who is mighty to save. Please stand in the room.
the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered in Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. abundant mercy, let us offer our prayers for a world in need. Spring of life, you give life to the dead. Fill us with your love until we have no choice but to love every wild animal, all the cattle, and all the birds of the air, every rock, all the oceans, and all the trees of the forest, every human from every nation and every culture and every gender. We especially bring our prayers to you, Lord, for those of our congregation, our family, and our friends, for Bonnie and her family as they readjust their life without the presence of Merck. For Laura and her family on the loss of Laura's father this week. For all who continue to grieve. Be with Karen Gentilini. Give her strength. Help her to feel loved. Be with Phil and Teresa on the passing of Phil's mother, Norma. Be with the Byer family who are mourning the passing of Uncle Patrick last week. Be with Steve and Tim Christie, with Christopher and Lily, with Denise. We boldly ask for healing for Annie and for Daniel as he supports her. We ask for healing for Mom Presha in the hospital. And we ask for strength and patience for all caregivers and all caretakers. Spring of life, you call into existence things that we cannot hear or see or touch or taste. Create in us hearts that are full of compassion. Receive our offerings of love and service. Raise up among us bold voices to call out injustice. Empower us to be tireless seekers of truth. And give us strong hands to do the work you have called us to do the work of love and mercy, thanksgiving and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Share a sign of that peace with one another. Thank you.
creator of all that is. Your earth is full of your gifts. Your grace and generosity know no bounds. Thank you for all that you have given us, for all that you have promised us. Receiving these gifts we bring, our treasure, our hands, our hearts, and bless them for the good of your own. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We give them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. God of heaven and earth, you spoke the world into being and called it good. Thank you for the mystery and beauty of the cosmos, for the wonder of this planet on which you have placed us, for breathing life into us and all that you have created. Thank you for making a covenant with us, for guiding our feet by your law, and by turning us around through your prophets. We remember that in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, Shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Feed us once again, O God. Make us one. Make us whole. That we may indeed be salt and light for the world you so love. All thanks and praise to you, triune God, now and forever. Gathered together as one by the Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God's table. All is ready. All are welcome.
to those of you communing with us from home this morning, this is the body and blood of Christ given for you. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. We thank you, generous God, for the refreshment we have received at your banquet table. Send us now to spread your generosity, your mercy and love into all the world through the one who is our dearest treasure, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. And now the God who calls us across the cosmos and speaks in the smallest sea, bless, keep, and sustain you now and to the end of the age. Amen. It is by his power and his love and his mercy that we, the cracked pots, the imperfect, the sinners, are received in love. Thank you.